All right, good evening. Yeah, stand up, Mike. The way to lead it, and that means everybody join Mike, so he doesn't have to stand alone. And let's sing unto the Lord for the moment here. And especially on Church Arise, right? Yeah, we better stand up. Uh, a fitting song, of course, about the church and a whole host of things. But notice verse 4, uh, where it's so spear come, but strengthen every stride. Tonight our topic is, well, we are cessationists, but what is this about? This is about... Uh, what we believe about the Holy Spirit and how he's involved in our lives today as the church. So that'll be kind of the topic, and it's a fitting uh, kind of prayer and song here uh, in that fourth verse. So I call that to your attention. Uh, but let's turn our attention to the Lord and ask him for his help as we study and sing. Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God. We thank you that you're merciful. We thank you for the gift of your Son. We thank you for his death and his righteousness, his blood, the salvation we have by him. Thank you, too, for the Holy Spirit. Spirit, we praise your name that you have opened up our eyes to see the greatness of Christ in the gospel. And uh, pray that you would uh, teach us more and more as you're apt to do to see the excellence of Christ, even as we get to know more about how you serve and work in your church. So do this for the glory of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Kyle, are you leading us in the verse? Thank you. Why don't you come on up and introduce it? All right. Do that. Well, I mean, it's actually pretty simple. We're all going to just get in groups and do a memory verse. The last time was this verse. Ooh. So if you can, try to do no card, no Bible, just go cold. And if you need help, help each other, and we'll talk about the verse next week. All right, let's go. What's the verse? Oh, yeah. First Peter 2. All right. Test is over. Oh. Hopefully you've memorized this verse over the past. Yeah, test is really over. Um, hopefully you've memorized this verse and it's been an encouragement to you. Um, it's the last week that we're working on this one. So if you don't have it down, that's okay. Because it's a lot of time. Even more behind. So it's a. Uh, what's the new verse? The new verse, Titus 2, 11 through 14. Oh, 11 through 14. Yeah. Lord have mercy. It's all about how God um, has given us Christ, and Christ is changing us. Hmm. Good way. How, by Him doing that, it's helping us fight sin. So, it's a good verse. Yeah. Titus 2, 11 through 14. ESV. Only. <laughs> it's just the one we're using <laughs> Well said. And we'll have cards next week for that. Thank you. In lieu of cards, in case you were techie, we were just referencing, I think Bradley here uh, was referencing an app. If this works, that'd be fun. There we go. Hey, that's my phone. It's kind of weird, I grant, but it's my phone, so who cares? But over here, there's this app called Fighter Verses. I don't think it's free. No? Two ninety nine to get the Word of God in you. I mean, come on. <laughs> Fighter Verses. And anyway, we'll see if this works. Oh, that is cool. So in Fighter Verses, there. This was put out originally by people associated with John Piper and Desiring God. Um, so. But if you pull it up, they have like their own fighter versus collection of things that's verses they all memorize and so forth. But there's this section called my verses and you can memorize, of course, any part of scripture you wish to. And here's a long list of different things I have going on. But I added 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. And so you can pull it up and it has the scripture there. Uh, you can what I normally do is I listen to the verse. Now, I don't think of these speakers on the TV work. Um, I forget it. I had a hard time getting it to work, period. No, I don't hear anything. A people for his own oh, possession, it's that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but... You get the idea, and it'll go and repeat. And you can take, like, this section, and I can ask it to do one of the verses at a time to repeat. Uh, audio, Chosen race. and I'll do that just that verse, or I can do them both together. So how I normally memorize a verse, I go one at a time in a paragraph, and then I do the whole paragraph at a time. 
So that's kind of how I like to roll. But, and then also, if you like to do, uh, there's like quizzes that'll make for you, like one of these things, you have to type the first letter, kind of like we did in the church history class. Like there's just, there's no excuses anymore. <laughs> Technology is caught up, right? So pretty cool. Uh, I've used it a lot and uh, with success. Um, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, how do you, I don't know how to say this. I don't think my memory is awesome. I'll, I'll say that. And um, so I'm like kind of memorize scripture. It's just hard, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, a number of years ago, they were, uh, the youth were doing like a play of some kind. And apparently I was like the stand in for the kid that got sick. Uh, so I had to memorize all these lines like in a day. Uh, I don't know, maybe VBS. I can't remember what it was. And I actually got all my lines down. And I was like, man, if I can do that with this script, dude, I can do it with the word. And it's true, you can. You just have to work at it. So I like to do it by audio, listen to it over and over and repeat it. Um, that's how I roll, but there's more than one way. So fighter versus, 299, getting the word in you. I'm not even getting compensated <laughs> for that. <laughs> yep. Okay. So thank you, Kyle, for leading us in that. And I will, Lord willing, have Titus 2, 11 through 14, queued up, ready to go with that, uh, hopefully one of these days. Okay, but tonight we are on uh, this, still on GBC Distinctives. Now we get to some of the big fun words that we maybe never heard of before. Uh, we are cessationists. Now, a little blurb about what in the, why do we use words that we've never heard? Because, for example, at least Baptist, you've probably heard before. We've used the word reformed, whether you're reformed in theology or you just had a, a reform of your car. I don't know. That's a word we use. Uh, cessationism is not a word we use. Uh, so why do we use labels like this? Uh, why do we use labels of any sort? Not even just theology, but also in life about things. What good do labels do? Then we can get to some of the challenges of labels, of course. But Come again? Yeah, it identifies something. Maybe something that's complex and you can summarize it in a word. Uh, so probably in whatever profession you're in, there's all kinds of jargon that's associated with your profession that I would know nothing about. Uh, I know Mike can talk about, what's the systems you run right now? Like you put systems together and you have all these names for those systems and how they, yeah, you. I don't know. It's like, it's like the, you talk about like you have to order the people and the right thing and the way it's, it's like the whole thing of your job, I thought. Man, I got to know. Anyway, you, you've spouted out the jargon to me before, and I like have no clue what you're talking about. So maybe cessationism is that word for you tonight. However, it is helpful. Uh, only not because we can go, we are cessationists, and you are not. Ha, ha, ha. But we can figure out what it means, uh, as much as it might be biblical, and we can hold to these things, or at least assess, assess them by Scripture. Um, but also then, it's helpful to know, well, what are the other options? And before we get there, I want to just summarize kind of where we've been, kind of for this class and thinking about who we are at GBC. I've thought about it like a, um, it is a funnel down to getting more specific who we are in the distinct Christian world. But it begins like this. We are first Christians. Hey, hey. And... When we were talking about we are Christians, what does that mean? What are we signifying? Not Buddhists, not Hindus. Yeah, pretty much. We believe in Jesus. Yeah. And so we share a belief in the Trinity uh, and a belief in Christ with uh, Roman Catholics and the Orthodox, so-called church. Okay. And we've talked about that some. But then under that, we are also Protestant. Okay? And in, to summarize, Protestant church, we hold to the solas of the Reformation. We would contend, the Bible teaches, that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. To the glory of God alone, and that's what Scripture alone, as the chief authority has told us. Now, the, hmm. remember also we talked about in the different doctrines we have like first order and second order and third order first order are those things that if you don't believe those you're not a Christian 
And so this is probably the first order dividing line right here. That is, if you don't believe <laughs> at least this and this, because you're trusting in Christ alone, uh, you're not really a Christian. Now, I'm hopeful in the Lord's mercy that there are people that associate with the Roman Catholic Church along with the Orthodox churches in the world that might be indeed true believers, but the heads of those churches and their official doctrines contradict the gospel as preached in the Scripture. Namely because they would say, yes, you need to believe in Jesus, but you need to, say in the Roman Catholic system, have all of the works that correspond with our sacraments and so forth. Again, that's against what Paul talks about in Galatians and Ephesians. Similarly would be the Orthodox Church. They would emphasize their certain works and their icons and also emphasizing uh, their traditions that in effect trump Scripture. Again, these things put you outside what I would say is the pale of biblical orthodoxy. But after this... We're at first order under there, and we're Protestant. Uh, the next one we talked about is that we are, what do we sit next? I guess we're Reformed-ish, we said, because I just like to do things like that. And what does that mean, we're Reformed-ish, is that we affirm, we have a high view of God's sovereignty, His control and salvation. Or summarized well, we would affirm what's called often the doctrines of grace or the five points of Calvinism. That God is the one who called us and redeemed us because we could not save ourselves at all in any way. Now, I said we're Reformed-ish because we don't baptize babies and do other things that are associated with many others who are Reformed, like Presbyterians. Nevertheless, that's who we are. Now, um, also, so we've talked about the last couple of weeks, what is the church and then the different ordinances. And so we'd also say that we are Baptistic. Or we are Baptists uh, because we immerse. And here's where we're getting to what are now probably more clearly second order doctrines. These, these teachings under here, if we disagree about baptism, it's hard to do church together. Though I can still think very clearly you're a Christian and a believer in Jesus. Make sense so far? Okay. So we've talked about baptism in the ordinances. And then tonight... We're going to talk about that we are cessationists. I had to look this word up a bajillion times to spell it right. I kept spelling it, and word, you know, checkers did not help me at all because they didn't have it in their dictionary, which tells you, again, it's not the most common word. But we are cessationists. Again, as we'll find, if we have strong disagreement about this topic, it's going to be hard to do church together. Okay. So to make a contrast, sometimes I think it's helpful, especially as we're getting into some of the finer points of these things, is to see, well, what, what, what's the other side of maybe any of these topics um, or defining features? And so, you know, what would be the opposite of the Christian faith? There's probably many, but... What's, well, yeah, true. <laughs> That was not the word I was thinking of, but you're absolutely right, honestly. Uh, but I was thinking, yeah, versus, uh, versus, that's, uh, that's the word I'm using because it's just easier in my mind. But yeah, any other religion uh, or all other religions, you know, they're on the other side of this Christian thing, okay? And then Protestant would be versus Roman Catholic and uh, Orthodox. That is the Greek Orthodox or the Russian Orthodox and so forth, okay? Reformed would be versus, we didn't use this term, but it is the opposite of that. It's the Arminianism. Okay? And so to be clear, I would contend, though I think Arminianism is a dangerous set of teachings and unfaithful to many things in Scripture, that there are many believers that believe these things. Does that make sense? I mean, I probably have weak beliefs too. I just don't know what they are. Otherwise, I'd change them. Yeah, so like... In, it would be the exact, con okay, hmm. history lesson, real quick. The Synod of Dort in 1609 uh, was a response to the teachings of Jacobus, Arminius, and his followers. And those remonstrances, as they were called, were five doctrines that they said, no, you're wrong, these things are what Scripture teach. And they're summed up in the acronym TULIP, which we talked about when we went through what does it mean we're reformed. That we would contend the Bible teaches that man is totally depraved, 
God only chooses them in the condition of his will, that he redeems who he redeems, the limited atonement piece, that he irresistibly draws them, and that the true believers persevere in faith. Arminius would teach the exact opposite of those things, in effect, that man is able of himself to get himself right with God, that the condition that God chooses is whether you would believe or not uh, beforehand, that God paid the atonement for everybody on earth uh, irresistibly, that you have the own right within you to draw too near to God, to seek God. And then finally, uh, true believers may or may not persevere in the faith and you could be lost. So that's what Arminius taught. And the Senate of Dort said no. Okay. Yeah, which is so cool because it was in Holland and they summarized it by the flower tulip in English. <laughs> Must be from God. All right. So, Baptistic, uh, what did I put as the opposite of that? Uh, that's hard to summarize. What, what word would you say summarizes the opposite of being Baptistic? Sprinkles. Sprinklers, I don't know. <laughs> Infant baptizers, baby baptizers. Uh, also, you could say Presbyterian, I think, um, though that doesn't summarize it perfectly either. Um, yet the Presbyterian groups, they're Reformed, clearly, but they don't baptize by immersion or necessarily believers. Wow, yeah, dude, you're, that's like more than nickel, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Pedo is child, so you're baptizing ch children or babies. And we would say we're credo-baptists because we baptize those who <laughs> creed have belie believed. Yeah, ha get out your dictionaries, right? Okay, so, but Presbyterian, I mean, a lot, pretty much all the major denominations, by the way, uh, baptize babies, except for Baptists. However, uh, Presbyterians would be a good summary of those who are Reformed, but they still uh, only baptize children. Well, not only. They chiefly baptize infants. Um, but anyway, we don't do that because we don't think it's biblical. Okay, now we're getting to another one. And so we're at cessationism. And maybe you're more familiar, at least with the term on the other side, and I think the most helpful one, or maybe one that you've heard, is charismatic. Care, huh. Care is... Yeah. All right. Have you guys seen uh, What About Bob? which is a film. But anyway, disclaimer, especially on audio. Uh, you can't, maybe you should see like the angel version. I can't remember. But they te he's trying to write down Lake Winnipesaukee and like three people are spelling it for him at the same time. That's how I feel right now. All right. C-H-A-R-I-S-M-A-T-I-C. That would be charismatic. I think I got it. Uh, it comes from a Greek word for charis, which means gift. And it's in reference to the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit has given his people. That's where that term comes from. Uh, charismatic, at least, is a word you've heard because it's a word we use even in, not in reference to theology, right? Uh, when we talk about a charismatic person or individual, we mean what? Outgoing. Outgoing, gregarious, yeah. That has nothing to do with this, just so you know, okay? So, charismatic people in one form or another, are saying that God has given by His Spirit all the spiritual gifts that are listed in the Bible for today, that they're all in practice and in action. Where we contend, no, the Scriptures teach and the example of the early church, that no, only some of those gifts still remain in use. Okay, we'll talk about why we believe that and why that's important. Um, I summarize it like this. So if you wanted to use kind of a one-sentence uh, definition, I think this one is helpful, which is, we believe that the special apostolic gifts have ceased with the death of the apostles. That is, these special gifts were tied to the apostles, so when the apostles are gone, those special gifts are gone. We would say those gifts ceased, and that's where we're getting this word cessationist from. Now, for me, it was fun this last afternoon, kind of doing a fresh deep dive. Well, not too deep, but uh, trying to figure out where did charismatic come from? 
Um, I mean, not the word etymology, but where, where did this teaching originate? When I came to Christ, uh, I would say the churches that I came to Christ in were uh, at least heavily influenced by charismatics, if not charismatic themselves. Um, is that true for anyone else? Has anyone else been a part of charismatic churches? Yeah. And, so, and it varies widely. And so this is kind of what I wanted to comment on because I was trying to figure out like where, where did these things come from? And it varies widely such that I think the, the danger or, or depth of error uh, varies considerably depending on who the charismatic is. So, for example, let me read you this quote. I wish I would have uh, put it on the PowerPoint, but nevertheless, you're just going to have to hear me out. This is from uh, MacArthur, John MacArthur's book, Strange Fire, that came out a few years ago. But he summarizes well kind of the worst part of what's considered charismatics. Okay? He says this, and again, it's, this is in reference to the Holy Spirit, what he does. So the Holy Spirit, he writes, found in the vast majority of charismatic teaching and practice bears no semblance to the true Spirit of God as revealed in Scripture. The real Holy Spirit is not an electrifying current of ecstatic energy, a mind-numbing babbler of irrational speech, or a cosmic genie who indiscriminately grants self-centered wishes for health and wealth. And I was like, dude, that's kind of, you know, that's pretty... Harsh isn't quite the right word, but very strong language. But no, th these are the exact words that some of the, especially the founders have used in reference to uh, when charismatic theology started really in the early 1900s. He goes on, the true spirit of God does not cause his people to bark like dogs or laugh like hyenas. And yet, we'll talk about this, there's people that say, no, he does. When the spirit's moving, you start barking. That's particularly associated with what's known as the Toronto blessing, if you'd heard of that. He does not knock them backward to the ground in an unconscious stupor. Have any of you seen televangelists push on people and so-called slay them in the spirit? This is where this kind of ideas come from. He does not incite them to worship in chaotic and uncontrolled ways. And he certainly does not accomplish his kingdom work through false prophets, fake healers, and fraudulent televangelists. By inventing a Holy Spirit of idolatrous imaginations, the modern charismatic movement offers strange fire that has done incalculable harm to the body of Christ. And that's strong language. But overall, when you're talking about the, 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 the especially the, the larger parts of this, he's right. Absolutely. He also had an older book called Charismatic Chaos, and he addresses these things. This is just from the cover, but this kind of the things that we're talking about. Signs and wonders, whether they're going on today, whether there's the speaking in tongues, if you're familiar with that, uh, the health and wealth so-called gospel, which is no gospel, by the way, uh, charismatic televangelism, really most of the guys you'd see on TBN, at least certainly of years ago, I don't even know who's on there anymore, but they were all charismatics. All yeah. And then does God still speak today? What does that mean? So uh, to give you the short, short skinny on this, what is going on? Well, in part, it was heavily influenced by this guy named Charles Parham. Charlie. No, I don't know if he went by Charlie. That's just kind of fun to do. But this guy, Parham, Parham, and he was from Kansas. So I guess bad things can come from Kansas, which I'm very sad about. Um, but the thing that he experienced or whatever, he connected uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit with speaking in tongues. Okay. Speaking in tongues. And so he had a special school and one of his disciples uh, named, true, which was Joseph Seymour. He led some revivals in Southern California on Azusa Street in 1906. So this is, you know, in the U.S. This is where it all started. <laughs> Isn't that great? But he, he was a Methodist uh, aspiring minister. But then he had this, what he called the baptism of the Spirit, People he ministered to started speaking in tongues, which the first person that did it supposedly was speaking in Chinese, a language the girl had never studied before, uh, though nothing was ever documented. You know, I might say conveniently. Nevertheless, John Seymour st excuse me, studied with 
Mr. Parham, and started leading revivals on Azusa Street in 1906, and it led to, uh, supposedly, a great outbreak of the Holy Spirit, uh, where there were so-called healings, tongue speaking, shouting, spontaneous preaching and yelling, people falling over, this kind of thing. And this is where it more clearly became, so evidently, that the tongue speaking uh, was what we would probably consider, if you heard it, you'd say it's babble. There are churches that practice this, that say, whether it's a tongue of angels or it's a private prayer language, but that they, they, they babble and they're actually being moved by the Holy Spirit. They babble because it sounds like no language and it is no language found on earth. Now, I don't have time to go into it, but as you go through the, uh, the Acts of the Apostles, okay, the biblical testimony of this, and also what you would see even in Corinthians, uh, tongues is just another, it's the Greek word for language, by the way. They're speaking languages that are known by people, but uh, I don't have time to get into that tonight. All right, but anyway, this started the Azusa Street Revival, and out of this came to birth the Pentecostal denominations, and there's, you know, several. There's three main ones that stem from Pentecostalism, and the three main ones I'm thinking of that I wrote down ahead of time, the Assemblies of God, which four square churches originate out of that, Church of God in Christ, and then the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, which I think eventually became Oneness Pentecostals, which you talked about them in the church history. They deny the Trinity. Okay, so this was in the... So in short, this, this was really sensational stuff. The mainstream Christians and denominations said, this is weird. Uh, we don't think it's from God. Uh, so they formed their own denominations and formed these Pentecostal groups. And then in the 60s, there was another supposed, the second wave where, um, how would you put it, but that these Pentecostal uh, type things, baptism in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, uh, started going into other denominations and such then. But it did not really hit the evangelical world until the third wave, which was, it's called, and that was in the 1980s, the early 80s. And that was especially associated with the vineyard movement. If you've heard of like vineyard, especially their songs. It's interesting how so many of these are associated with songs. But the vineyard movement, and what's the name? John Wil Wilbur? Is that his name? I wrote it down. Wimber. Wimber, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, like when I came to Christ, I came to Christ in the mid-90s, mid-late 90s. Uh, yeah, the churches I was involved in were heavily influenced by this stuff. And this led to what was later on, I already alluded to it, the Toronto Blessing, which supposedly was a great revival. You know, we're all hearing about the Ashbury Revival now. We'll see what comes of that. Um, but the Toronto Blessing, and that became really sensational. The thing that defined it usually was laughing and uh, barking. Uh, as a theology nerd in school... You know, a bunch of us were like, oh, there's a theology nerd conference in Toronto. Let's drive from California and go. So we did. And we went to the epicenter church where it supposedly all happened. And we were greeted by members who were there when it all went on the first time. And I mean, they talked about Jesus. I think they were sincere in their faith. But, you know, they barked and did things that just I don't see as biblical. So I'll leave it at that for the moment. Um. Along with a lot of these things, like the Toronto Blessing and how it entered into the evangelical world, you had what's called uh, power evangelism, which is any true evangelism of speaking the gospel must be accompanied with miracles, must be accompanied with speaking in tongues, healings, and prophecy. Okay? And if that's not going on, it can't be evangelistic. And so you have modern-day prophets and apostles also in their groups. We're going to talk a lot, actually, about that as we continue. So there's some, I mean, honestly, there's some crazy stuff out there that's associated with, with this Pentecostal movement or the charismatic movement. Um, there's some more, I mean, you might just put it softer charismatics or small c charismatics for sure. So, for example, uh, the denomination of churches represented by Kingsway just up the road, who we prayed for, I think, this past Sunday. Uh, they are a sovereign grace church, so they are technically charismatic in that they say some of the gifts are for today that we would say are not. 
but they're very, I would contend, controlled with their charismatic views. Such that Pastor Matt, who's there, he was like, I'm so glad John MacArthur wrote Charismatic Chaos. Because there was all kinds of chaos going on out there. Okay? And yet, I would still contend with my friend and brother over there that even your small C charismatic, if we can say it that way, I think is dangerous for the church, too. Okay? And yet, I consider him a brother. We can agree to disagree, but we can talk about that. So, uh, charismatic you're probably familiar with. Yeah, some of us have been in churches that are like that in various ways. And some of you have probably, maybe you've been in like a health, wealth, or healing scenario, or you've seen it on TV, or some of you have just, you've been in a church culture that often talks about, Jesus is telling me this, he's telling me that, I need to tell you these things. And again, that kind of flows still into this uh, charismatic idea. All right? So far, so good? Or clear, at least that much. All right. So what does it mean if you're not charismatic? You're a cessationist. That what it's, that's what it means. Is that easier to say? All right. So what does that mean? Well, let me show you uh, where that is in our doctrinal statement or what we teach, because this is talking about the distinctives of GBC in two minutes or less. Here we go. Um, begins this way. This is under uh, the whole I think under the church. I have the reference at the end, so I guess we'll get there. But here's what it says here. The church, God gives the church spiritual gifts. He gives spiritually gifted men to the church, chosen for the purpose of equipping the saints for the work of ministry. And he also gives unique spiritual abilities to each member of the body of Christ. And to that, like, charismatics and us are in full agreement here. So understand this. If this isn't in, you know, immediately clear to you, when you become a believer... The Holy Spirit's done a work in your heart. And in that process, he's equipping you for ministry in his church. And he's done it with special, they're called spiritual gifts. That is, the endowments of the Spirit working through you, equipping you for this ministry. All right. Goes on in our statement. However, this is where it gets distinct about us. We teach that there are two categories of spiritual gifts given in the New Testament. And what are they? A miraculous signs and wonders, gifts of divine revelation, and then in, say, Corinthians, it lists a bunch of these, and also in Ephesians and Romans. But what are the ones that are miraculous signs and wonders? Well, things like the gift of apostleship, prophecy, miracles, healings, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. So that category, we contend, we're given, and I highlighted this, temporarily in the apostolic era for the purpose of confirming the authenticity of the apostles and their message. So by my highlights, what am I drawing your attention to about those miraculous gifts? They are temporary and they're tied and associated with whom? Apostles. Thank you. Okay. So what are the other kind of gifts? The permanent, non-revelatory, okay, not revealing new truth, Equipping gifts like teaching, helping, administering, administering, ministrating, ruling, evangelism, pastor, exhortation, giving, showing, mercy, faith, etc. Given to equip believers for edifying one another. So those gifts are still active. So by saying we're cessationists means we think some gifts are not active and some are. And this comes down to, as I continue in the doctrinal statement, why this is important. See, we understand that with the New Testament revelation now complete, there's a couple of references there, Scripture becomes the sole test of authenticity of a man or anyone's message. And confirming gifts of miraculous and revelatory nature are no longer necessary to validate a man or his message. I'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So that means... The only spiritual gifts in operation today are those permanent, non-revelatory equipping gifts given for edification. So if I was going to summarize this, and again, that's found in our doctrinal statement under the topic, the church, spiritual gifts. I would put it like this. The Holy Spirit worked uniquely in the time of the apostles to ensure the establishment of the gospel. And he did so through revelatory gifts and miraculous signs. Apostle's message being established by these signs and revelations given. And what are those revelations that the apostles and prophets gave us? The New Testament. Okay, no mystery. 
So then, but then with the passing of the apostles, the church already stands on their doctrinal foundation preserved in the New Testament and all the scriptures. And so we look to the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures as God's word for his church today. And in that we have everything we need for life and godliness. And this is the key. This is what makes it distinct or potentially a danger to affirm that these revelations are still happening. And saying, yeah, you got the Bible, but I also got something else. I got a special word from God. And we're saying, no, you don't. And yeah, I don't need it because I got this. All right. So why do we teach this? Well, as I highlighted, uh, a big part of this is understanding um, where this relates to really the apostles. And so we're going to talk about the apostles for a few minutes, who they are and what they did. So who were the apostles? And so here's the scripture. Why do we believe these things? Why do we believe there's two sets of gifts? Well, the apostles were really special. And that's, in effect, what we're getting to here. So Mark chapter 3, verse 14. Maybe if I can turn this, some of you more can see a little bit. Mark 3, 14. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles. Of course, this is Jesus. And what are they going to do? Interesting. Notice the first thing he mentions is that the apostles were to be with Jesus. And so then he might send them out to preach. Or similarly... You remember that, of course, Judas is one of the twelve, one of the original apostles. He commits suicide and, of course, betrayed Jesus. And they're casting lots to then find the replacement. Well, among the men, who are they going to choose and find to be a replacement? Well, it comes down to a couple guys, but here's the requirements if you're going to have a replacement apostle. So one of the men whom have accompanied, accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So the only men that could be an apostle with the 12, they had to have seen Jesus, been with Jesus from the beginning in this case, and they had to have seen him resurrected. Similarly, Paul talks about this, about himself. In 1 Corinthians 15, he says, Then he appeared, Jesus appeared to James, then to all the apostles, the rest of the apostles, last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. Of course, Paul was a Johnny-come-lately as it comes to apostleship, right? But when did he encounter the risen Jesus? On the road to Damascus. Yeah, yeah, on the road to Damascus. Yeah. yeah, I mean, he was directly commissioned and called by the apostle, or excuse me, by the risen Christ which he saw the risen Jesus and he was commissioned by him. And these are the two requirements then of what we need for an apostle is that he had seen the resurrected Jesus and he had been commissioned by Jesus. So if you hear about somebody today saying, I'm an apostle, okay, I don't think we need to be rude, but biblically speaking, no, you're not. Because, or you saw the risen Jesus. Like, that's what you're telling me. And Jesus commissioned you. This wasn't like, I had a call in my life, and I'm thinking I'm this. No, if you're an apostle, at least in any kind of biblical sense, and carrying that kind of authority, um, then you saw the resurrected Jesus, and you were commissioned by him. And not only were they specially commissioned men, but these men, it's very clear that certain uh, works or deeds walked with them, as they went and preached the gospel. So we read about the special works of the apostles. So I'm just going to give you a couple examples here. You're often, we're very familiar maybe with the, the healings in uh, the book of Acts, for example, but we see that it's especially tied to those original witnesses, the apostles. For example, Hebrews 2, verses 3 and 4. How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Of course, this whole book really is like, don't go back to Judaism, come back to Jesus. So this great salvation, it was declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard. Well, who was that? Who had heard from the Lord about this salvation? The apostles, right? While God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. So how was God from the very beginning sending the gospel forth? Well, it was going forth by his apostles who had seen it, and then God worked with them, bearing witness with signs and wonders and miracles as the gospel first went out. 
Or similarly, Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 15. He says, summarizing his ministry, For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed. So what is his ministry? Obedience to Jesus. That's what he's done among non-Jews. But how, what does this look like? Verse 19, By the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Lycrium, uh, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. But again, you see, this Apostle Paul, what's accompanied him is he's gone to preach the gospel, signs and wonders, and the powers of the Spirit of God. Finally, let me give you one more verse here. 2 Corinthians 12. You remember this book is really Paul's defense for, I am your apostle. Like, I preach the gospel to you. Why are you turning away from me? And in defense of his apostleship, he brings this up. The signs of a true apostle were performed among you with utmost patience. And what were those signs? Signs and wonders and mighty works. But notice, these are the signs, not just of the gospel going forth. It's not the signs of Christian preachers. It's the sign of a true apostle. These are special miracles that tied to the apostle. So we see that these apostles had a special role that God had given them. They had received and preached and they wrote divine revelation. They laid the doctrinal foundation of the church that was confirmed through miracles, signs and wonders. And such that uh, we know also from church history, many that came after, they did not consider themselves at all the apostles or taking on their authority. So what we're saying is in their special role, when the apostles left us because they died, uh, so did their gifts. And I think one of the best proofs of that in the scripture, I admit it's an argument from silence in a way, but I think it's a pretty powerful one. What was the last book Paul probably wrote? Bless you, by the way. Yeah, 2 Timothy. What does he talk about in 2 Timothy, like all the time? What's that? He, he mentions his ailments at the end. He does. And he says, bring me a cloak because I'm cold. Bring me the, 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 bring me the books, actually. Yeah. But what, how does he exhort his protege? Go into your closet. Make sure you really get a lot of the Holy Spirit. Make sure you're doing a lot of those miracles. Is this, does that occur anywhere in 2 Timothy? In case you don't remember. No, it doesn't. What does he talk about in 2 Timothy? Try this. Let's just flip through a few verses. All right. I didn't uh, put them on the PowerPoint, so you've got to humor me. Actually, open our Bible at Bible class. Huh? What kind of things is he doing? Is he setting, like, this apostle says, I'm about to die, right? He's, he says at the end of this book, I finished my course, I finished the race, I'm leaving Timothy, and here's what I want you to know, right? Look at chapter 2, verse 1. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me through many witnesses, entrust to faithful men who will be able to do more miracles. What does it say? Who are going to teach others, right? There's this passing on of the gospel through teaching. This is his mission. This is what he's called to do. Or hence, uh, verse 14. Rem uh, of the same chapter. Remind of them of these things, testifying before God not to wrangle about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Verse 15. With earnestness, present yourself to God as one approved. A worker is no need to be ashamed. Doing what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. This is what we're about, right? And of course, we'll have to skip just for time. But... 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed, can't get better than that, and it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for any good work. So in light of that, he says, I admonish or charge you or testify before you, before God, and before Jesus Christ, who's coming to judge the living and the dead. I mean, he's laying it on pretty heavy, right? And at his appearing as a kingdom, what is the command? 
preach the word. Be ready at good seasons and bad seasons. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all patience and teaching. Because the time will come when people not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears to accumulate from themselves teachers to suit their own passions, having wandered from the truth, having gone off into myths. But you do the work of the evangelist, fulfill your ministry, preach the word. Right? This is the center. This is what the church must be built on. This is, a, this is the call Paul gave to his church. So this is what we're supposed to be focused on. This is what it looks like for God's spirit to be with Timothy, which he prays for at the end. So, preach the word, and that's why we will do that as a church. He doesn't talk about miracles and so forth. Plus he tells him that one of those, right, to take yeah. Timothy to take wine. He said, yeah, for his stomach, sure. He like, yeah, he didn't say like, yeah, pray harder for your healing, have more faith. Another one of those letters where somebody can't come because they're sick, he doesn't heal them. Yeah. He might have been done maybe before. Yeah, that's right. Even some of the gifts might already be uh, kind of moving away in that respect. No, good point, brother. Yep. All right. Which brings us then to just underscoring the apostles were special. They had a special role. They had special works. Um, I would like to spend a lot more time on this, um, on this next one. Was What was prophecy in the apostolic church? But honestly, I'm going to uh, summarize, okay? Because we only have so much time. But... Why we're dealing with prophecy in the New Testament church, especially among some of our more, I don't know, like-minded, charismatic friends, um, they would say, yeah, the apostles aren't here, but we still have prophets like in the New Testament. And so what's the point with that? We're still getting new words from God, is their point. Okay. And it's called New Testament prophecy. Though they'll say it's probably a little bit different, such that, the likes of, maybe you've heard the names of some of these theologians before. Uh, guys ever heard of Wayne Grudem? Mm -hmm. Sam Storms? Mm -hmm. Matt Chandler? Mm -hmm. John Piper? Mm -hmm. They're saying prophecies for today. And it can be wrong, because it's different. Mm -hmm. It's not the same kind of Old Testament prophecy. Old Testament prophecy, we would all agree, did two things. Foretelled and foretold. To foretell was to tell God's truth. That's what the prophets mainly did, actually. But they would also foretell, that is, tell the future. Uh, the bet, I love the examples in Isaiah. They're awesome. Go read Isaiah 44 and 45. It's just this whole setup. Who is the God that can tell the future? It is Yahweh. He's the only God. Ah, I want to go teach it, but we can't. We don't have time. All right. And they couldn't get it wrong. So, for example, in the law in Deuteronomy 18... We read this, and if you say in your heart, how may we know the word that the Lord has not, excuse me, let me read that again. How may we know the word that the Lord has not spoken? That is, it's in assessing, like, how are we going to know if he's a true prophet or not? Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And of course, there's other warnings in Deuteronomy 13. When the prophet gives a word and it doesn't come true, he can be put to death for speaking presumptuously, presumptuously for the Lord. Right. So you didn't get it. You didn't get a chance to get it wrong. Right. If you really spoke for God, God does not have a speech impediment. Right? He gets it right through his prophets. And we see that the New Testament prophets do the same two roles. Namely, so for example, in Acts 11, we read this. Now in those days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. It's actually going north, of course, but anyway. And one of them named Agabus, one of the prophets, stood up and foretold by the Spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. So they end up taking collections for the Christians in Jerusalem. But Agabus is predicting a famine before it happens. You might say in a lot of ways like Joseph. So they can foretell or foretell, excuse me. But they also foretell. They tell forth truth like in Acts 15. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who are prophets themselves, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. Okay. Just like Old Testament prophets, New Testament prophets are giving, getting revelation from God to their brain, and they're telling you, thus saith the Lord. This is the pattern. Mm -hmm. 
And so they don't get a chance to get it wrong either. And they have control over it. And some more of these things. I can't go into the more of the details, but to say this. Prophetic revelation we see, like new information given to man out to given from God to man out. It was a part of the early church, and it came, God gave new revelation through the apostles and prophets. And this prophetic office, along with the apostles, was for the establishment of the gospel's teaching. But again, the implication is, once the apostles uh, and the gospels established, once the apostles die, these gifts cease as well. So we're not expecting new revelation. Like, I trust you're there, right? You're not expecting me to come up on a Sunday morning and say, I know the Bible's good, we've been enjoying Exodus, but I got a new word for you. Okay, I hope most... Well, I know the elders would tell me something before I'd get too far along. Yes. All right. Why? Because the church is built on the gospel of Christ. You almost want to... I want to say it like this. The church has been built, but it's still built on that static, firm, delivered faith of the gospel. Similarly, one of the later books written, Jude, can say, you know, we need to defend the faith delivered over to the saints. Uh, we have the faith of the gospel. It's in this book. It's been preserved for us in writing. And this is the word that we have from God. And I think a great example of this point, even Paul's making it, is here in Ephesians 2. So he writes this. So then, speaking of these Gentiles that have become Christians, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And he notes this, you are built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. So what's the foundation that the church is built upon? Christ is the cornerstone, but what's it also established by? The foundation of the apostles and prophets. Now, I think a reasonable question is, um, one, are these Old Testament prophets or New Testament prophets? Well, I don't think they're Old Testament prophets because of the way prophets are talked about in the next chapter. So if you happen to be there... You can look, um, but it's right here in, I have chapter 3, verses 3 to 6. But here in Ephesians 3, Paul talks about it and he says, uh, it's been made known, The mystery has been, been made known to me according to Revelation, as I've wrote to you before in brief, to which you were able to read to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which... Other generations had not known among the sons of men as now it's been revealed to the holy apostles and the prophets in the spirit or by the spirit. You see that there? So he's saying there's a new revelation that's come with Christ and it's come through the holy apostles and prophets. So this is not referring to Old Testament prophets, but new ones. I think that's the context too, as he's talking about here in just a few verses earlier the foundation of the apostles and prophets. These are New Testament prophets. Now, also, the ESV translates this. I love this, the way they do this, because it best corresponds to the Greek here. But you'll notice you have the foundation of the apostles, and it does not say, nor does the Greek, and this is significant for the Greek, it does not say the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. In Greek, in this case, when you have the article, the, okay, it modifies and goes with apostles and prophets because they are grouped together. That is, they are giving you a single witness. And it's that foundation together that is what the church is built on. Again, making this case. So that revelation that the church is built on, when the apostles go, I contend to you, the prophets have gone. We're not expecting new revelation. So that means when we have the book finished, we have the foundation we need for life and godliness. We have it here. 
And this corresponds nicely, uh, or exactly, actually, with the testimony that we have from church history. I'm going to blitz you now with a number of quotes. Won't that be fun? From church history. But it just confirms this very thing. It's odd that all of this fascination about charismatic stuff, at least among the Orthodox Church, had never come around to like the 1900s. And any real fascination with all of these gifts in the church history were associated with heretical groups. But anyway, here it is. So first off, notice this. This is Clement. He's writing about 100 A.D. Okay, and he says this. The apostles received the gospel from, for us from the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ was sent forth from God. So preaching everywhere in country and town, they appointed their first fruits when they had proved them by the Spirit to be bishops and deacons unto them that should believe. So this is kind of like we, we studied a lot, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2 uh, in the class. You know, entrust unto others, um, and to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. He's saying that's what the apostles did. They found some guys, they approved their first fruits, that is, those men uh, who were approved by the Spirit, that is, bishops and deacons, and they were carrying on the gospel. But they are not the replacement or adding to the gospel. Similarly, again, Ignatius, another early church leader. I mean, this is, I mean, some of these connections go almost right back to the Apostle John. But here it is, Ignatius writing to the Magnesians, Be zealous, therefore, to stand squarely on the decree of the Lord and the apostles, that in all things whatsoever you may prosper, together with your most reverend bishop and your presbytery. But even the bishop and the presbytery and Ignatius, they're standing on what? The Lord and the apostles and his teaching. Okay, because what's the point? Ignatius and Clement, if there was anybody who were the heirs of the apostles to have their authority, if there were going to be any apostles of the next generation in the church, it was those guys. And they're telling you, we're not apostles. We stand on the apostles. Later on, you have John Chrysostom talking about 1 Corinthians 12, and he says this, about 1 Corinthians 12, that passage. This whole place is very obscure. He just appreciates his honesty. It's hard to understand. But the obscurity is produced by our ignorance of the facts referred to and by their cessation, being such as then used to occur but now no longer take place. Because 1 Corinthians 12 has all kinds of bits about prophecy and the different kind of gifts of the apostles and so forth. So Chrysostom, looking at church life, he's not even arguably recognized as the greatest preacher of the ancient church, you know, after the apostles. And he's saying, yeah, those kind of gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians 12, prophecy and so forth, they've ceased. We no longer see them taking place. Or Augustine, the great theologian of the next generation after that, he said, in the earliest times, the Holy Spirit fell upon them that deliver, that spoke with tongues, languages, which they had not learned as the Spirit gave them utterance. These were signs adapted for the time, for there was the beginning of the Holy Spirit in fall tongues to show that the gospel of God was to run through all tongues over the earth. That thing was done for a sign, but speaking of the tongues and associated miracles, it has passed away. Again, it's a pretty bold statement to now say, well, finally God's doing something now since 1900. And God's really like, forget these guys. Now the Spirit's really moving. Or what about the time of the Reformation? What about Martin Luther? He said this, the visible outpouring of the Holy Spirit was necessary to the establishment of the early church. Once the church had been established and properly advertised by these miracles, the visible appearance of the Holy Ghost ceased. Or John Calvin. It's a very honest quote about this. And I think in part why there's some difficulty. But he says this, Though I think it does not say exactly where he wished miracle working to be an occasional gift, that is, the scripture does not precisely say when it was going to end, or one to abide in his church forever, yet it is more likely that miracles were only promised for the time to add light to the new and as yet unknown gospel. We certainly see, I think, that their use ceased not long after the apostolic age. You know, so Calvin, he's ministering, <laughs> you know, what, f almost 15, 1400 years after the church started, and he's saying, in history, we haven't seen those kind of signs repeat. All right, Mike, thank you.
understanding of Christ and the apostles. And so the parallel between the Old and the New Testament, and that was more helpful to me yeah. uh, coming out of uh, a charismatic context. Mm, yeah. Yeah, and we see other glimpses, though, with like Elijah and Elisha. Um, but even then, if you think about it, this is actually the whole Bible. Um, there's a lot of time in here where there's not special miracles going on. And even this, this covers a long period of time. And maybe we're having pretty much all the miracles written. That's not a lot if you think over all that time. And yet we think in our own age, because we're so important, of course God's going to do special miracles for me. Um, I think that's often how it plays out. Or just in the best light of it, an earnestness that would want to see God do amazing things in our time. And we can pray for these, and yet at the same time, I think we just say, Lord, you're, you're in control, and you will do what is best for your church, and I will trust you. All right, so that leaves then to kind of talk about why does this matter uh, to kind of boil some of these things down. So I want to first just deal with the question, does the Holy Spirit speak or prompt us at all today? And I want to quote to you uh, a theologian, a recent one, Tom Schreiner. He's still very much alive, thankfully. And in his book, Spiritual Gifts, he said this. He says, They can't be of great importance, like these promptings and so forth, because Scripture doesn't address them. It doesn't follow then that impressions are useless, for we may share many thoughts with others and believers that are not actual words of God's in conversations, in small groups, and even larger meetings. We don't dismiss the value of such insights if they're not the ins- even though they're not the inspired words. We are reminded, however, we should not overstate impressions, that we need to be very careful so people do not rely on them. Some people are quite confident by nature and confuse their own certainty with the leading of the Spirit. I think this is the key chief issue. So, for example, using the reference of the Sovereign Grace Church up up the way, um, they have a prophecy mic in the aisle during their service. So I credit them, if they believe the gifts continue, which they do, that they want to do it in order and orderly. Paul commands that in Corinthians chapter 14. So they think those gifts are for today, so they're going to do it in an orderly way, and I totally commend them for that. I'm thankful. Um, But they have a prophecy mic in case the Spirit moves and someone has a word from the Lord. And I've preached there several times. Um, Great services, by the way. And uh, there was one time that it happened. And here's what it looked like. Somebody came forward. This lady had a word from the Lord. And one of the elders screened her, that is, had to hear the word from the Lord. And he let her, during between songs, give that word. And the word was something along the lines of, I know someone, I, God told me someone needs this encouragement. And then they read a scripture passage. So I, I'm like, I think I agree with like 98% of what happened. Just don't call it prophecy. Don't call it a word from the Lord unless it's the part you're reading, <laughs> right? But let's depend on God and his word and not confuse our impressions or what we're thinking with his word. Because his word is infallible, but we are very fallible. So does God lead and prompt? He might indeed, but how do we know? Well, we always have to test it by his word. And sometimes we can see by hindsight, wow, God, that was very providential how you worked there. But in the end, the authority must be scripture, not our heart, not our impressions and so forth. I think that's true. Also, why does it matter whether we call something a prompting or impression or from the spirit? Like, again, we want to say, here's what he clearly says and point to his word. Why? Because we know the scripture is sufficient. We don't need anything else. It's not like when he charges Timothy to say, um, to preach the word, which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and training in righteousness. It's because it does everything you need it to do. You don't need any more words from the spirit. You have his word, which by the way, the spirit inspired. Okay. So beyond that, then what is the role of the spirit today then? Well, I hit just three big highlights for you. We're very thankful. The Spirit is well at work today, even, even if He doesn't work in some of these more, quote, sensational ways. Um, But for example, Paul talks about this in Corinthians, and we very much think this is how the Spirit works often. He's talking about when the Jews hear the Scriptures read, many of them do not believe, because a veil of unbelief is over them. They can't see the truth. However, he says, but when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed 
And now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There's sight. You can see the truth. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In short, the Spirit is the one who opens our eyes to understand the truth. And this is what the prophecies were about in the Old Testament prophets. Or another way to say it, the Spirit causes new life, regeneration, you to be born again and to come to belief and understand the gospel. Thankfully, the Spirit very much is at work in those things. The Spirit's also at work in our sanctification, making us more like Jesus. Thankfully, we're not left to our own devices, but the Spirit indwells us to work against our old sinful flesh. So, Paul writes to the Galatians, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. That is an awesome word. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And of course, later it talks about the works of the flesh versus the work of the Spirit. But the Spirit's in us, working. In the prophecy from, oh, is it the one from Ezekiel? He's causing us to walk in His commandments. And finally, too, even though we believe some of the gifts are not for today, many are. And the Spirit's giving us those that we might then serve in His church. Hence, like 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good, the good of the assembly. As each one of you, as you've been called to faith, He's equipping you to serve in His church to build up the body. Hence, 1 Corinthians 14, 12, so with yourselves, so you're so eager for the manifestations of the Spirit. You know, the Corinthians were taken up with a very flamboyant, manifest gifts of the Spirit. Well, he says, well, yeah, whatever. Use those to do what they're for. That is to excel in building up or edifying the church. And that leads to this question, I think so important. Well, how can we be led or filled by the Spirit? Back to the charismatic question, kind of in the origination. Do you need to be baptized by the Spirit and start speaking in tongues? to then uh, be filled by the Spirit or to be in tune with the Spirit or useful to the Spirit or led by the Spirit. There's so many different verbs we could use here. Well, I think this parallel is so key in Ephesians chapter 5. And do not get drunk with wine, for that's debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. That's a command, by the way, which is interesting. And what will that look like when you're filled by the Spirit? You're going to be And again, not all those sensational things he's talking about, but when you're filled by the Spirit, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now, Paul, in another passage, uses language just like this. You guys recognize it or remember? What's the passage? Yeah. Yeah. And yet, he's not talking in Colossians about being filled with the Spirit, but what is he talking about? Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Isn't it curious, if the Word of Christ is in you richly, it's going to result in these things, and if you're being filled by the Spirit, it's going to result in basically these same things. Can I make a connection for you? You want to be filled with the Spirit? Be filled with the Spirit's Word He gave you. The Word of Christ. You want to be filled by the Spirit? There's no secret. It's just the regular means of grace, we call them. Bible intake, prayer, fellowship, and dependent service. Now, means of grace. Who's heard this term before? Probably some of us. And it is just those things. Bible reading, prayer, fellowship, service. Now, but they're means of grace. Don't think that means, okay, if I read my Bible for 20 minutes, I've eaten grace, and now God loves me more, and I have special spiritual power. That's not how it works. Um, It doesn't quite work like that. Why not? Well, you're trying to fellowship with God (laughs) and God's person. You know, I can't just expect... Well, Erin, I made the bed today. Actually, I, don't, I think she helped me. But anyway, 
uh, I made the bed today, so she needs to be extra nice to me or something. Or I took out the trash. Like, it isn't, like, it's a relationship. Like, yeah, maybe, but what if I was a jerk to her the whole rest of the day? Like, it's fellowship with the person. But how this works with the means of grace, uh, the analogy I like to use is, and we'll have to end with this, is it's kind of like the means of grace are bus stops in the Christian life. They're bus stop terminals. So you've got your prayer bus stop and you've got your Bible reading bus stop or Bible intake. You've got your fellowship with the saints bus stop. And the Holy Spirit, if you're going to get picked up and led by the Holy Spirit, you're going to need to probably wait at those bus stops. That's normally where he picks you up. That's normally where he influences you and changes you and leads you and guides you. Now, on occasion, did you ever miss the bus and like chase down the bus driver and have them stop? I did. So the Holy Spirit can meet you in other places, so-called. But where is he usually going to be? He's going to be at the bus stop waiting for you as you're waiting on him, praying and being reformed by his word. So in conclusion, then, why does this matter for church life? Well, it plays out like this in these three ways, at least. I think there's probably scores more. But one, this means we're, we are, as a church, a grace Bible. We are unapologetically Bible-centered. We're not embarrassed about it. Why? Because this is how you encounter Jesus. It's through his word. That also means reformation and revival. If we see it in church history, but let alone even in the Bible, it's driven by God's word. Not something else. And finally, Christ's word, which by the way is given by his spirit, must rule in our church, not our feelings or our impressions. So we keep going back to this word. And that's who we are. And that's what makes us cessationists. We are Bible-centered. Now, thankfully, like again, our dear brothers, Kingsway up the road, they, they would agree with all those things. I would just say, ah, agree with us a little more. I think for your good and the good of the church. But they might say the same back to us. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, we can have good fellowship. But anytime that fellowship starts undermining the word, we're just weakening ourselves in the church, aren't we? And that's a concern. Evis, yeah, really. I know you guys like Spurge. I was looking for this for 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Great little quote from him. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good to end. I won't do the whole thing, but he says, I have little confidence in those persons who speak of having received divine revelations from the Lord as though he appeared otherwise than by and through the gospel. His word is so full, so perfect that for God to make any fresh revelation to you or me is quite needless. To do so would be to put a dishonor upon the perfection of that word. Hmm. Yeah, good word. Yeah, there's a, a similar one. It's attributed to John Owen, so I'll give it to him. I don't know if it is, but it's something like, yeah, if your personal revelations, uh, if they're not needed if they agree with Scripture anyway. And if they don't agree with Scripture, they're certainly not needed. So what's the point? <laughs> and that's kind of what Spurgeon was saying, right? All right, well, let me pray for you and we'll, we'll, we'll go. Father, we thank you for your word. Oh, we thank you for the Holy Spirit. Oh, Spirit, we thank you for giving us your word, inspiring that word, inscripturating that word, preserving that word, and most of all, then taking that word and turning it into our hearts and changing us. And uh, we pray that by your spirit, O oh God, that we would be humbled, that we would be submissive, that we would really see it, the treasure that really is. Um, and even as we don't maybe always feel so moved, uh, move us anyway. Uh, align our hearts uh, with the truth, the glorious truth we know in these things. We might just show the world that you are alive and you change people. Change us, we pray. In your name, amen. Amen. amen.